We are having with us um, Warren Nydick. Uh, he's an artist um, originally from US, so he's very much concerned about the elections coming. Uh, he's also very much uh, politically concerned and involved, so he's going to speak also about the political aspect of many of the, of the things that uh, are related with technology, but also related with our interrelations in the contemporary society. He is this, uh, he's that kind of artist that you don't really know what is their expertise, no, but they are testing a lot of mediums and ways in order to understand what is the intersection of culture, language, art, uh, brain, and he will be talking a lot about the human brain. He has been, we have been talking uh, in a very short but interesting conversation about how the human brain, it becomes a hub and how the architecture and the physical space can influence that hub. He's talking about the neuroplasticity that I guess you will be introducing today, but also how the brain is affecting the space and how the space is affecting back the brain. And I think this kind of um, interesting, let's say, intersections of uh, human cognition, space, technology, and different ways of expression, uh, they're going to be a very interesting uh, setup uh, for a conversation. So I want to Thank you very much, Warren, for being here today with us. And please help me also welcome him, Hatiak. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I got a tour of your facility here. And I'm just, I love the vibe. And I also totally, this area over here was just exciting me so much, uh, like what you're doing here. Because I think you're going to feel very connected what I'm do with what I'm doing, because I think it, 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 could, it could make a conversation with that work. Um, and uh, I think as this work kind of thinking moves forward, where buildings actually have uh, become li life, where they have livelihood, where they, they modify themselves and, 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 and their actual c conditions as a result of interacting with the environment and interacting with their own materiality um, and this relationship between their own materiality and the materiality of the world. That be, it's really exciting, exciting things can happen. Now, I'm also going, you might also feel that so I'm, uh, my work is political and I am a kind of um, consciousness raiser. So, you have to understand that's part of my my theme, that's part of why I do what I do, why I'm here tonight, why I do the research that I do, you know, why I've been spending the time is because I want to raise consciousness. I'm already too old to change the kinds of things that need, you know, I see need some changing or need some awareness so that you, as you work in the real world and you move from here into your livelihoods and your architects in the world, that you can make changes. And one of the things I always say is that we are the visual and cultural specialist and the the economy and the world and the social political conditions of the world are moving more and more into our laboratory into our field and that is that what that means is that you have a lot of power and you have a lot of power to make changes and as you uh, infiltrate the various um, strati stratas of, of communicative and semiotic capitalism and, and now cognitive capitalism. As you, as you're, as you um, infiltrate into those areas, uh, people are going to need your skills and your skills can be, you have a choice on how you want to use your skills and I'm hoping that in a little way tonight, in my own little way, that you're going to be, um, you, know, folk, you know, thinking about some of the things I'm thinking about, you know, and, uh, you know, here we go. So, I want to, this is an architecture lecture. Now, I specifically spent all day today researching uh, books about architecture and papers about architecture because I wanted to talk to you directly. I am an artist. I have studied architecture. I was four years at Delft as a research researcher there. I wrote a book called Cognitive Architecture from Biopolitics to New Politics. So I wanted to really focus on architecture. 
And, but before continuing, and also, I thought this would be easier for everyone. I'm, instead of reading a paper, I'm kind of putting the paper up in slides, and that's for two reasons. First of all, I'm, I don't speak Spanish. Apologies for that. I should, but I don't. And so I thought that perhaps if I put, for those who don't speak English, that they can, a lot of people can read English. So I thought we can read along together and the paper is kind of visualized. It takes a little bit more time though, just to tell you why I have a slide here. Okay, so before continuing, I want to say right from the beginning that the terms evolutionary architecture uh, and the Mendelian genetic model it proposes and the term I will introduce epigenetic architecture are conditions of the world and the brain and you should keep that in mind in the case of evolutionary architecture it is a model that in many ways mimics that of Fordist laboring as it begins to adjust to its imminent subsumption by the post Fordist and postmodern condition Machinic intelligence, formal subsumption, abstract labor, separation of the proletarian and the bourgeoisie as a means through which orders are transcribed and carried out. In the case of epigenetic architecture, cognitive capitalism and semi-capitalism rule the day in the transformation of labor and the brain labor and the brain, and I'm going to go deeply into these, so don't worry if you don't know these words because I'm going to talk about them more. Precarious, nonlinear distributed conditions rule the day as the brain becomes delinked from its modernist modular condition to become the connectome. And it's good that you don't know these words. That's what I'm here for. So here is the way the brain used to be looked at. The brain, as you can see, is made up of lobes and different lobes that were, and still to, many people think, are hubs of different kinds of information processing. So you have the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain. And what do you think the primary visual cortex does? It processes visual information. You have the, the frontal cortex. Where is it? It's in the front of the brain. It deals with prognostication, uh, thinking about the future, uh, attention, um, and uh, what's called working memory. And we'll go into that a little bit more. So these different lobules, these different lobs, they were, these different kinds of um, lobules had specific cytoarchitectures. What that means is cellular architecture. The architecture of the cerebral cortex, the outer covering, the outer, outer mantle of the brain has a specific architecture and the way that the cells are organized give them specific functionality hold on now I figured this out but this is the way that the brain is pictured today and the pressure is the connectome the connections of brain regions together with hubs that connect signals among different brain areas and a central core or backbone of connections which relay commands for our thoughts and behaviors. A new MRI technique called diffusion spectrum imaging anal analyzes how water molecules move along nerve fibers. DSI can show the brain's major pathways and will help neurologists relate structure to function. Isn't that what architects do? Structure to function. Structure to function. The way that the brain, the architecture of the brain, the architecture of the world, there's, they use similar vocabularies, but they're talking about different kinds of things. And here's another kind of connectome, but here is a map, a, a, a functional map, a map that's changing, it's dynamic, and it's about internet use in the world. A web, it's the web of the world, the internet, the world wide web, the connectome, hubs, edges uh, of, of uh, you know, the way that neurons and neural connections are made and the way that they're made is based on use. It's not that they've been programmed. This isn't a reductive or deterministic model that I'm talking about. The connectome is not, it's, it's something that develops in its relationship to the world and it's constantly changing and it has a certain size. You can't, it can't go down to a single neuron. The connectome is, 
a group of neurons that function together in time. It's not reduced to the DNA or the RNA. It's not reduced to the nucleus. It's not reduced to the action potentials. It's not reduced to the amount of chemicals that are transformed. It's not about that. It's not a reductionist model. Okay? So just remember that. And here we have this node strength, node centrality, core membership. It's like we're talking about web structures, network structures in the world. I'm sure in your own designing, if you look around here, you know, you see that you're already dealing with these terms. You understand these things. You studied architecture, but you understand brain anatomy as well. Now I'm getting back to the core understanding of this lecture, which is about the relationship between evolutionary architecture and this term that I've developed called epigenetic architecture. In Gordon Pask's forward to John Fraser's book, An Evolutionary Architecture, do you all know that book? Who, who knows that book? Well, it's, it's the kind of basis of all parametric, um, all the parametric equations you're using right now. It all comes from this guy's work. So maybe it would be a good idea to maybe take a look at it. Anyway, we're going to talk about it today a little bit. The role of the architect here, I think, is not so much to design a building or a, building or a city as to catalyze them, to act that they may evolve. Furthermore, the principle exhibited has particular contemporary relevance as society and the environment, a futoria, the built environment, become ever more dependent upon a meaningful information transfer. He already understood the idea of the knowledge economy and how knowledge and information would become the data through which we are now making our architecture. Uh, if you accept this information environment is, is becoming of increasing significance, then you must admire this work. This, these prescient words seem predictive of a future role of architecture, which has come to pass in cognitive capitalism, which we're going to talk about. Architecture is information, immaterial labor, and infrastructure. And this is the book by John Fraser called uh, An Evolutionary Architecture. This is one of his models. And let's go through evolutionary architecture because epigenetic architecture is built upon the formation of evolutionary architecture. It's built on its models, but it's very, very different. Architecture is considered as a form of artificial life, subject, like the natural world, to principles of morphogenesis, genetic coding, replication, and selection. Do you know what the word morphogenesis means? Who knows what the word morphogenesis means? Morphogenesis. The, right, come on. The changing of shape. The way shape changes. Morphogenesis relates to the developing fertilized egg. In the human being, for instance, when the uh, egg is fertilized, it goes through a series of transformations from two cells to four cells, then it becomes a ball of cells with a hollow cavity called the blastula, then it becomes a gastrula, then it migrates at that point in and implants itself into the uh, um, uterus of the woman where it then continues its, its um, development. That process by which different cellular structures, different kinds of tropism, different kinds of chemical changes that take place, different kinds of emerging patterns is called morphogenesis. And who's read Gilles Deleuze? Anybody read Gilles Deleuze here? Right? The body without organs. Who knows that term? Has anybody ever heard that term? The body without organs comes from the process of morphogenesis. It comes from the process of morphogenesis. Because in the process of morphogenesis, the body is without an organ. Without organs. It doesn't have an organization yet. It hasn't become an organism yet. That's what morphogenesis, genetic coding you know, replication you know, selection we're going to go into. So here is the first part, which is, well, hold on. I don't know why I can't go one more back. Oh, this is, no, we're going, well. 
Oh, now it is. So the first thing, morphogenesis, genetic coding, replication, and selection. Then this slide shows the DNA molecule being replicated. And what happens is that the, repli the DNA unravels. It's a double-stranded uh, uh, strand. It's a double strand made of uh, nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, in a specific order, which is a co every three of them of which is a code. It splits, and then it recap recapitulates itself. And that, this becomes a, an, a way of understanding architecture at this time. This becomes a model for genetic architecture. It, it's an inspiration. Architectural, now the second part, number two. Architectural concepts are expressed as generative rules so that their evolution may be accelerated and tested. The rules are described in a genetic language which, which produces a code script of instructions for form generation. How many times have you heard in architecture form generation? How many times? A million times. This is where it's all coming from. Computer models are used to simulate the development of a prototypical forms which are then evaluated on the basis of their performance in a simulated environment. And here we have the DNA to RNA to protein. The DNA splits, the RNA then uh, transcribes it, it's called transcript, uh, messenger RNA. It happens in the nucleus. The, me the messenger RNA um, uh, basically uses the DNA as a script and except it substitutes uracil for cytosine, which is one of the nucleotides, and that's what makes it different. It diffuses out of the, uh, of the nucleus into the cytoplasmic area that surrounds the nucleus, and there it finds ribosomes, and the ribosomes then are the factory, the factory where the proteins are made, the factory where the car is made, the factory where the materials to make the building, the cement blocks are made, the, um, the, 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 the factory where the steel is made, this is like a factory. It's based on a Fordist model. It's based on a Fordist model of the way that an assembly line operates like the ribosome and the DNA is transcribed and products are made, the proteins which are the building blocks of the, of the models. Yeah? To achieve this, we have to consider how structural form can be coded for a technique known as genetic algorithm. We're talking about algorithms here already. How ill-defined and conflicting criteria can be described. How these criteria operate for selection and how the morphologic and metabolic processes are adapted for the interaction of built form and its environment. In turn, our description of an architectural concept in coded form is analogous to the genetic DNA script of nature. Voila. And here's one of his pieces. The perfection and variety of natural forms is the result of a relentless experimentation of evolution. So these, these, um, these codes create all these forms, and these forms are then produced, and then they interact with each other in the environment. And just like natural selection, the Darwinian natural selection, those forms which are best adapted uh, to the environment, they continue to, to go on, and those that aren't are displaced or removed. And this is what genetic architecture is, or evolutionary architecture is. It's basically that model. And here we have these, the uh, Darwinian evolution and the survival of the fittest and how natural selection works. And you see that in these pictures of the finches, that the, the finches have different size beaks. And that, the size of that beaks and the way that they've evolved is related to the kinds of insects that they eat and the kinds of seeds that they eat because certain kinds of beads if you notice the seed the seed eaters have very uh, thick very um, short very heavy beaks because they have to crack the seeds whereas the um, the ones who are the insect eaters they have longer and more refined uh, uh, beaks and I would I would also suggest that those beaks have to do the the insect eaters on the kinds of insects that they are actually eating so insects that have hard shell would require more like a seed eater beak, those that are flying or like mosquitoes or something like that which need a kind of finesse would have a thin uh, beak. Evolutionary architecture, okay, so I think we've talked about that enough and this is like 
the relationship between DNA and the computer, uh, how does storage work, and the criteria for success. In order that natural selection should work, so this, why I showed this, Mm, something's wrong with this thing, I don't know. Why I showed this was because there's a relationship between the DNA code and the way that he oper works with the DNA code and uh, the kind of uh, code that one uses to, um, to write a script for a program in a computer. And that's why I showed this, okay. Um, in, okay, we're going to skip that one. Even though Fraser uses the word epigenetic on a number of occasions, he does not use it to include its processes in his theories. The production of form is basically based on natural selection of generated forms interacting in a field of other forms. Those forms which, are, which survive are the fittest. Epigenetic architecture. Today, I would like to introduce the term epigenetic architecture and with it, evaluated the consequences of the digitalization of our contemporary world as it transforms from the society of the spectacle to the society of data. The society of data is the fundamental condition of what I would, will call the statisticon. Epigenetic architecture, like the statisticon, are imminent conditions yet to come. We're not here yet. The initiating circumstances are with us right now. And here's the famous book, The Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord. And of course, I put this other slide in, my thoughts have been replaced by moving images, you know? Like, because in the end, the mind and the brain, especially in cognitive capitalism, where the mind and the brain are the new factories of the 21st century, the mind and the brain is, is, is the place where capitalism is putting all its energy. Epigenetic architecture is the latest manifestation of genetic architecture. It's, it's built on genetic architecture. It's not something brand new that doesn't have any, uh, you know, uh, doesn't have a history. It's built on genetic architecture. Uh, it too uses the metaphor of the genetic codes replication first conceived in the Watson Crick model. By the way, that was the Watson Crick model that we saw. But goes further to understand the conditions of regulatory genes through which genes are turned on and turned off. So we have all these genes on the chromosome. The genes are there and the genes are sections of the chromosome. And on the, sec on the sections of the chromosome, these genes, they have regulator places on them. The, not all the gene is active all the time. And, and a lot of the reasons why we have illnesses from environmental catastrophes or from pollutants in the world is because, as I will show you, the, uh, the environmental uh, toxin can uh, act on a regulator gene and turn on a part of the gene that wasn't supposed to be turned on. And that's when we get sick. Like uh, autoimmune diseases are famous for that. Okay, epigenesis is a term originally coined by C.H. Waddington in his now famous concept of epigenetic landscape to express the way in which a genotype, the genetic makeup of the 23 pairs of chromosomes, gave rise to the phenotype, the observable, observable physical characteristics of an organism. Today, it refers to the mechanisms through which the environment and culture Culture is our, the environment, that's key. Culture, culture is the environment. Architecture, culture. The skin of architecture, culture. The history of architecture, cultural memory. The, the hetero, uh, hetero um, the multiplicity of architecture, the cultural landscape. Today, it refers to the mechanisms through which the environment and culture modulate the heterochronous unfolding of the genome by turning on and off regulator genes that affect gene expression and phylogeny. And here is how a gene, I'm not gonna, this is in biology, so we don't have to go that deeply in, but you can, basically what happens is, is that the genes are wrapped in these histones, and these histones do not allow certain parts of the DNA to be accessible. When an epigenetic factor comes, it makes, it, 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 dis, it disrupts these coverings, this enclosure, and the gene becomes active. But most importantly, I want to address its neuroscientific definition, first conceived by Jean-Pierre Changeau, entitled The Theory of Epigenesis of Neural Networks by Selective Stabilization of Synapses, linked as it is to the way the environment, architecture, design, 
sculpts the neuroplasticity of the brain. If we are to understand the full implications of our accelerated, technologically advanced world, we must understand these key concepts. Importantly for architects, it provides a model through which adopt adaptive architecture might process change and truly adapt. Your models over there, that's what I was so excited when I saw those models, might process change and truly adapt forming an intelligent architecture that is truly intelligent. And this is his famous paper, and I don't have to read the whole thing, but I do want to read some of it. And I want to go down to theory, according to, okay, the theory of epigenesis of neural networks by selective stabilization of synapses according to which the environment the environment, architecture, design, affects art as well, affects the organization of connections in an evolving neuronal network through the stabilization or degeneration of labile synapses associated with the state of activity of the network. Epigenesis in the brain and the world too. So here is a little bit through this other process and lo and behold, it has the terms Darwinism again, neural Darwinism. And it's a it's Gerald Edelman, a famous neuroscientist from California, where I'm from, where I'm living now, but he's in San Diego. And he was actually a, fam a very famous cello player. He, he really, and played the violin. And he called these things the primary repertoire because as a musician, he was always, in he was always talking about his repertoire, what kind of music he could play. So in the primary repertoire, the events are happening in the womb of the mother. The brain is developing, as I said, through this process of morphogenesis, depending on the DNA and the, D and the, uh, the DNA of the mother and the father, depending on what happened, what are the events that happen during the pregnancy. The mother might get sick, the mother might take a drug or whatever, and also on the history of the species. That DNA, that, those three factors create what's called the primary repertoire, which is a neural architecture. It's a neural neural architecture, but it's a neural architecture that has not experienced the world yet. It's a neural architecture of the child in the womb. I call it a neural zoe versus a neural bios. The neural bios is what happens later. The neural bios is the politicized brain. It's the brain that has now been sculpted by what? By language and culture. That's called, so the neural bios the neural zoe, excuse me, the neural zoe is the brain as it first comes out into the world and it hasn't had language and it hasn't had culture and the neural bios is how it becomes sculpted. So then you have experiential selection. So there's primary repertoire which is in the womb and then secondary repertoire is experiential selection and there are changes in synaptic strengths. Depending on what the world is made of, the brain has all of this potentiality and the primary repertoire is tremendously variable because the brain doesn't know, for instance, let's talk about language. There are 6,700 languages on the planet Earth. The, the baby fetus doesn't know what language environment it's going to grow in. If it's born in Barcelona, it could learn Catalan, the, the, the symbolic ecology, the semantic ecology, the language here, the meanings of words, the whole ecology could be of a specific kind. Which would, which would select for, select for specific neural networks. If the child was Asian and was born, uh, it doesn't matter, if the child was just born in Beijing, and would learn Mandarin. The environment of the Mandarin is a complete sounds of Mandarin, the grammar of Mandarin, how it, uh, the, the meanings of the, of the forms, because it doesn't use letters, it uses pictures, is completely different. Yet, the child's brain can learn Mandarin. The brain has this incredible variability in the primary repertoire. It's tremendously variable. It's not predetermined. It, oper it changes in terms of the environment that it's in. And that's what causes the secondary repertoire. I'm not going to talk about reentry. It's a little too much. Well, here is just so that who knows what you guys know about neuroscience or biology or whatever. I have no clue. So I just throw this up there so you can see what a neuron is. A neuron is the is the basic uh, uh, you know uh, 
cell structure of the brain and the nervous system and it's the way that information is transmitted around the brain and it has a nucleus where that DNA is and it has a cytoplasm and it has an axon hillock where the axon begins and where the uh, action potential which is the energy that moves down the axon is is started and then it stimulates these um, these nerve ending fibers where what's called um, the vesicles the neuropharmacological vesicles like serotonin and noradrenaline and dopamine and uh, such as those are stored and released and then voila this is the key this is like there are certain things that I'm going to say like this is an important slide this is an important slide try to remember it okay so here, this is a famous, it's a very famous experiment of Leve and Stryker from 1979. And what, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a 17-day-old kitten, the visual cortex of the 17-day-old kitten, and then you're seeing the adult kitten. And you're looking at the different structures of the baby kitten at 17 days old and the adult kitten. So tell me, just shout out, it doesn't matter. What do you, what's the difference between these two pictures? Tell me. Or, or somebody describe what you see on the left. What would you say? I mean, what's the structure? What's the morphology? What is, what, describe it for me. Nerve endings. Nerve good. They're nerve endings. And are they ordered or disorganized? Are there lots of them? Are there less lots? What's the story? Tell me. Complex. Intense. 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 Branchy. Branchy. Chaotic. Come on, guys, in the back here. Self-organized. Self-organized. There's a lot of self-organization there, for sure. What else? No, that's about it, right? So over on the left, we have this really chaotic, disorganized bunch of nervous elements. And then what happens on the right? What happens to the right? So, so on the right, what happens? What do you see on the right, on this one? Natural selection. Right. Natural selection. Someone said selection. Absolutely. What else? The effects of parameters. Right on. Right on. The effects of parameters. Exactly. The cat world, so to speak. Or this specific cat's world. This specific species of cat's world. What they eat. What they see. What's important. What are important. What kind of colors uh, are they important for mating. Uh, what kind of materials they need for making an, uh, a place for them to sleep. Um, you know, uh, certain cats climb trees. Certain cats don't. Certain, you know what I mean? They live in different environments. And as a consequence, there's a pruning. There's a pruning going on, like on a fruit tree. If any of your parents have fruit trees, or you've been to a farm, you prune the tree, you cut the branches off to make the other branches stronger. Here what happens is, there are all these neurons over here on the left, and some of them are not relevant to the survival of the cat. Not really. They're not important. And some of them are extremely important. The ones that are not important go die off. They get pruned. The other ones that are important, they have, they, they, they make stronger connections, they, um, they uh, multiply, and they have emerging, emergence is also very important at this point as well. They, there's emerging things that happen in between these, these cells that have been selected for. And you have this finely tuned visual cortex of the cat. That is epigenesis. That is architecture. The architecture of the nervous system changes as a result of experience, right? Can buildings do this? Are there buildings that can do this? Are we trying, is that what you're trying kind of to do there? Is that a place maybe to go to over there? Yeah? Raise your hands. Come on. Show me. Show me you're involved in this situation. Okay. Great. That guy's got his two hands. Thank you. <laughs> And here's something really interesting too, because it's just not happening in the perception, it's also happening with emotions. It's happening with feelings. And here is, there, believe it or not, in the natural world, mice and rats, there are mothers that lick their babies a lot, and there are mice that don't lick their babies a lot. Believe it or not, it's hard to believe, but it's true. And they are considered low grooming and high grooming. And what happens is that if you 
then uh, examine the cortex of those babies that have been uh, groomed a lot versus those that didn't get a grooming, a lot of grooming, the neural structure, the, the network, this incredibly complex entity on the left is much less developed than on the right. The one that had gotten licked was more exploratory. It took chances. It, was more, it wasn't afraid. It wasn't stressed out. And therefore, it explored the world. And it made more kinds of connections. So that, just for instance, just to give you an analogy, say this was a subway system. This is LA on the left. And on the right is Paris. OK, I don't know Barcelona very well, sorry. But let's say it's Paris. And say, for instance, the train, there's a derailed train on one of the tracks. If I'm going to a point where that yellow, I don't know see if that yellow nodule is, I can only take that line. I can't get there any other way. So if there's an accident, there's a problem, I can't use my mental capacity to think of alternatives. I basically have to sit there and wait. Where if I'm in Paris and I'm trying to get to Odeon and I'm up in Klangencourt in the north of the city, there are so many different routes that I can take. I can use my brain and I can say, well, you know, I can't go there, but I can take the six train to this train and that train and I can get to my point. So I have more options. It's less stressful because say, for instance, it was like an important date and I had to be, be there. I would be less stressed because I could get there if I was able to use my intelligence. Materiality gives us the opportunity for th cognition and for thinking. The more complex the nervous system, the greater the opportunity for creative thoughts and the greater possibilities for thought. This is the essence of epigenetic architecture and cognitive capitalism, the, emancip in the emancipation in cognitive capitalism, that is. And here is a weird thing I wanted to show you. Here's a, a musician, there's two musicians here, and one is a, viol a violinist and the other is a piano player. Now I'm showing you, what I'm showing you here is, uh, I showed you cell cellular neuroplasticity, what was happening at the cellular level with those, with the cats at 17 and then the adult cat and then the baby rats, the licking and the non-licking. I showed you, now I'm showing you stuff that happens at a gross level, what you can see on the, on the, on the surface of the, of the brain or the cortex, and it turns out that the right hand of your right hand is represented in your left brain, your left hand is represented in your right brain. And it turns out that the left hand here, the left hand on the violinist, violinist has to do very intricate maneuvers, very quickly, rapid, whereas the string where the bow is one movement, one longitudinal movement, you know what I mean? So the, this one's going like this and this one, and it turns out that if you look at the, um, if you look now at the left hand going to the left hand, let's see, left hand, right, going to the right brain, and you look at the, the right hand going to the left brain, you can see it's like a bodybuilder on the right side. The, 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 these gyrus, those, they're, they're on this surface of the brain. You see gyri and sulci. Sulci are the valleys, and gyri are the mountains. And it turns out that because of this violin, violinist has played so much violin and has practiced so much with that left hand, that on the right side it looks like a bodybuilder is there. The, the gyri are like mountains. They're thick and they're, they're really full. Whereas the other ones are kind of thin. I don't know. Can you see? I can see it. Do you see it? Do you see on the right side it's very thin? They're like, they're like very thin. Whereas on the right side it's really thick. That's because of practice with the, uh, because of the different hands do different things. Whereas in the piano player, because the piano player has a right and left hand and it's kind of equal, the cort cortices are pretty equal as well. And I put this slide in, I wanted to find more slides, but I, you know, I, the, the lecture is going to be long enough anyway. I wanted to show the incredible variability. Variability and neuroplasticity are the two most important things that give us freedom and that allow us to have freedom and that are our only saving grace. So I wanted to, to show you how neurons are in a conscious experience Conscious, how consciousness and this uh, this kind of uh, meg, which is a type of uh, 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 EEG, 
there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're all doing the same thing, yet the pattern of their brain waves, of their conscious experience, is completely different. They're all doing the same thing, but the variability is unbelievable. That's what makes us, that's our saving grace. The brain is tremendously variable, not only at birth, like I mentioned to you in the primary repertoire, but because our experiences are so different. We interact with the environment, we have brothers and sisters, we have even traumas, we have all kinds of things in our lives that make us different and make us different, unusual. And those are reflected in variable nervous systems. And therefore, when you hear Jacques Rancière, which I'll talk about in a minute, talking about distributions of the sensible as a political entity, uh, and you really have to wonder, because this is what doesn't allow this kind of politics of the distribution of the sensible, doesn't allow it to happen, because the brain that is responding to that distribution is so very, very different. The Statisticon. So here is the Statisticon. This is a drawing that I have made, and I also have a neon. And it, as you can see, it's a hub. It's a network. It's just like the networks that we've been seeing. But the hub is the Statisticon, and it, it's on a number of different pathways, and it has a number of different edge ways. So one on the on the most one of the most important things for us to talk about is that it's related to neural capitalism. We're going to talk about neural capitalism. Neural capitalism is all of the of the kinds of corporations and all kinds of technologies that are being made today that have very, very positive possibilities but also have negative possibilities and we have to be aware of the negativity of them as well as the puzzle. Hopefully they're, they're for the good of man. I'm like hoping myself. But the reality of it is that when you think about how human beings are and the way they use technology, one always has to be aware that there is a cynical side to it. So, but we have neural capitalism coming in. These are technologies, pharmacology, big farm, drugs for the brain, drugs to treat attention deficit disorder are a type of technology. They are made in laboratories. They are mass produced. They, and, the, and unfortunately, we're over diagnosing ADD and we're over medicating. And, there are, and as I will show you, there's reasons why. As you can see, I have smart cities, the Internet of Things, parametric architecture. That's also becoming part of the Statisticon. I have inf infotainment, communicative capitalism, cinematic trucage, special effects, after effects. I also have this other side, which are the emancipatory. On top is all the emancipatory in green and yellow. Shamanism, drugs, anarchy, noise, autonomy, autodestructive art, conceptual art. That's all possible that, uh, that they can be emancipating. And epigenesis. Epigenesis, yes, we will see that epigenesis can have negative implications, but it also is an emancipatory. Architects and artists, as well as governing governance and the process of normalization, can use neuroplasticity and epigenesis f to emancipate the brain and make that complex brain that we saw with the, the baby rat that had been licked a lot. We can make those complex brains. We have the capacity. If we take it on and we believe in ourselves and we believe in our power, we can help in the future to emancipate the brain and we can continue and make it variable. The Statisticon is the perfect and seamless confluence of the conditions of massive data collection, epigenetic sculpting of the brain's neuroplasticity, parametrically derived smart and sustainable architectures and urban design. Why? Because they produce data. And we are in the society not of media, but in the society of data. When you move into a room and all the lights turn on, or you go to a toilet that can say, can actually say what kind of, uh, kind of chemicals are in your urine, or if you're stay sitting on a floor that has, is specially interactive, it can tell you who you are by how you're standing, your specific posture. If you, these kinds of things produce data, and they are being looked at they're being looked at by certain kinds of people, and they're being bought and sold. That's why I put it in there. The process of valorization. 
the technologies of affect integrated into post-production and special effects. The idea that when we look at we look at news today, it's no longer it's infotainment, it's entertainment news. We're not looking at news now that is really telling us a story. It's news that is attempting to get us riled up. It's, it's, a, it's a news that is using certain kinds of editing procedures and, after, and, and different kinds of computer programs to hype up the image, to hype its affect, to get into our emotional systems, to go through our primitive brains, and not our rational brains, but our primitive brains coming up through uh, the paleo cortex into the lower brainstem and into the, 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 the part of the forebrain called the ventral medial frontal cortex. These kinds of things are happening. They really are. And you see it. You see that the hip hop, if you look at a hip hop uh, uh, um, uh, music video and you look at the way that the editing has been done, every three seconds you'll see an edit. It's an edit jump that goes with the beat. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. There's, a, there's, a, there's a continual change of the image. Then you look at sports and all of a sudden you start seeing that same methodology making sports more exciting the the goal that now the the, the kick of the goal in the football the, the the goal that's been you know that gets in the goal and and they go they do a little bit of reverse uh they do rewind a little bit and then they then they go forward again and then they then they break the the kick into its various components they're creating interest they're creating attention they're in cre they're creating money and then you look at what's going on in the news and you see similar techniques being used in the actual newsreel. Check it out. Go home, watch the news today. I'm not going to go into Foucault and Deleuze and all that because we don't have time, but that's for another day. Then we have cynical materialism versus emancipatory materialism. I can't go through all these things, but I wanted to talk about some of the ones that had to do with architecture. How am I doing with time? I have an hour, so what time? I don't even know what time I started. Where are we with time? Anybody? Ten or fifteen minutes. Okay, and that's with the hour that I was promised. Okay, good. I know, you see what I mean? But I've talked, anyway. So there are f four things that I w could go into depth with, but I can't. Neural ethics, Jameson and hyperspace, the so-called neurobiological sublime as an emancipatory condition. We're going to get through that. The mobile architectures in the Egyptian spring, internet and natives and immigrants, cognitive capitalism, neural technologies, neural capitalism, smart, smart buildings, smart cities, sustainable architecture, the society of big data, the internet of things becomes the internet of everything, including the brain. When the brain is in there, it's the internet of everything. And we better, be, we better really be careful, because that internet of everything, that data is what's sculpting the brain. That cat that we saw, from the 17-day-old cat to the mother cat, that cortex is not going to be it's not as already being sculpted by simulated truths and simulated environments. It soon will be, that's all data. Virtual environments are data. That's what I'm saying. Those will be sculpted by this society of data. So don't think that data is just something, you know, oh, it's so cute that we can do this, we can hook up everything. Isn't that cool? You know, we can wear Google glasses, you know. No, it's not. And you have to think about what you're doing. There are implications to that. They're not bad things. Just rethink them and figure out ways of, of that the data can be used in a way that people who have negative intentions can't use it. Neural ethics. We have a role. Architects and artists have a role in neural ethics and the statisticon. Scientific American. What does this mean? Better brains. Who decides what a better brain is? Where are the artists, the architects, the humanists, the poets? Where are they in this discussion? Come on, where are they? We're not in that discussion. We're not being asked. In fact, what we do they think is stupid and shit. You know, I'm telling you, it's true. I've dealt with a lot of people. We are not, we are not part of that discussion. We need to be part of that discussion. Well, we have to be educated about the brain, we have to be educated about neuroplasticity, we have to be, understand all of this stuff so that we can be part of the conversation. That's all I'm asking. 
You know, our buildings, what, what the kinds of decisions we made, we gotta, we gotta have, we have to, we have to know why we're doing things and what the ramifications of what we're doing are. I want a better brain, but I want a poetic brain. I don't want an efficient brain that can stand in front of a computer or in front of a video game that's in a tank so that I can fucking kill people in that tank, okay? Because I'm really good in video games and my brain has been adapted with special drugs and special training that I become an incredible video player, computer game, and now I can, they, they have those in the tank that I'm using to murder people. I don't want that. I don't want that brain. I want a poetic brain. I want a brain that makes my brain complex. I don't want to build cities where everything is homogenized and everything looks the same. That there are no questions. There are no places to travel. There are no places to walk anymore that are not filled with concrete. You know, I don't want to live in a world where there's less birds and less plants, where the fauna and the flora have been decimated by the stupidity of human aggression against nature. I don't want to live in that world. And I don't care that they can make computer bees. I don't care that now they can make a bee. Oh, we don't have to worry about the bee, the, the deaths of all the bees, because we can just make a bee. We can make an electronic bee, like, like, a, uh, like a, uh, a, a small little computerized uh, machine that could fly around. I don't want that. The issue, what does a better brain mean? I think I just, just, <laughs> just I talked about that. So here, this is the cynical materialism. This is the New York Times. This is like the best paper in America. And what they're showing in 2004, that they have different pictures of Ralph Nader. He was one of the politicians running for president. And they're showing this patient a lot of pictures of Ralph Nader to see which picture they like the most, which is reflected in the part of the brain that, that is lit, lights up the most. So this is called, you know, MRI machines are used to see partisanship in the brain. What, are, what, what uh, public relations campaign, what image they're going to use for the public relations? I don't want this. This is not what neuroscience, this is not what epigenesis, this is not about a better brain. Okay? This is not a better brain. We should not be spending our money, taxpayers' money, because this is research, and we, sh we shouldn't be spending it on this crap. Come on. And here's another one. Different, different, uh, these are from journals, from very established, very respected neuroscience journals. Opal, Citroen, Rice, these are different brands, and they're looking at which of the brand causes the most reaction in the frontal, uh, in the brain, the anterior medial prefrontal cortex, where this kind of thing is picked up. I don't want this. No, no, I don't want this. The Arab Spring is a case of point of another kind of, of a possibility. The new uses of social media to produce smart mobs and flash mobs created a technological divide between digital natives, those born after the tsunami of digital effects, and the internet immigrants, those who were born before the introduction of digital technologies. Their dissimilarities were constituted by familiarity and lack of familiarity with these burgeoning technologies, as well as forms of collectivity they generated. Technologies that created catastrophic field changes across the social, political, and economic landscape as well as the brain. As a consequence, two radically different populations of Egyptians arose. Those limited by a perspective of urban space as a static entity, right? Those who, like the Murabak headquarters was in this high, big tower, an old-fashioned building, and the other was a different populations of Egyptians who were on mobile phones and had created this mobile architecture. Because the, the, tech, the network of mobile phones is a kind of mobile architecture. It's a dynamic architecture. And because of that, they were roaming and they could congregate and they could come here and they could come there. And here is a life net system. Uh, of course, it doesn't have a hierarchy. It doesn't work on, on, on this hierarchical method. It works on a, a distributed, nonlinear, non-hierarchical non method. 
and here is Tahir Square, and then here is, this is the destruction of the, the National Democratic, but where Murabak's headquarters, this is the destruction. And it kind of is a metaphor, the destruction for a kind of thinking, and a kind of technology, and a kind of architecture. Political power no longer radiated from a tower or public building. A metaphor to appreciate, this change is the fire that consumed the Murabak headquarters. In contrast, power became distributed in network emanating from the mobile hubs and their constantly shifting net landscape. And those pictures of the brain that I showed you, the brain has also changed. The brain has changed. It's no, no, no longer talked about as a modular brain like those first pictures that we saw that come from the 19th century and had to do with the beginning of modernism. They're not. They were, if you remember the, the different kinds of brain structures that I showed you, they're now networked. They're called um, cognates, and, and the brain is now called a connectome. And this is, um, this is a, a very famous architectural theorist named Frederick Jameson. And I put this in here. I'm only going to get through to this. this is, I'm just going to finish this part and whatever. Unless you want me to go on. I can go on. You let you decide. If you want me to go on, tell me. Otherwise, I finish with this part. So, Frederick Jameson, 1990. I am promos, promote, proposing the notion that we are here in the presence of something like a mutation in built space. He was talking about a building and he was talking about hyperspace. He was talking about this building that was in Los Angeles. It was a mirror building, and I'll show you a picture of it. People didn't even see it. They would walk in, and they couldn't even understand it. They couldn't even see it. There was something about this building, the new kinds of technologies that were being used. Like people don't see, believe it or not, those Frank, the Frank Gehry building, the Bilbao. They don't really, at the beginning, they, they, it was something so beyond their grasp. Same with this the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles. And he says, I was, I was here in the presence of something like a mutation in built space. My implication that we ourselves, the human subjects who happen into this new space, have not kept pace with that evolution that there, just like there's an acceleration of technology and that w there are many, many people that have not kept up with the technology, with the acceleration of technology, there is an acceleration in the cultural landscape, which is the architecture, without a, a, an acceleration or an ability of the, of the neuroplasticity of the brain to be sculpted in the habits of perception to keep up with those new things. There has been a mutation of the object unaccompanied as of yet by an equivalent mutation of the subject. We do not yet possess the perceptual equipment to match this new hyperspace, as I call it, in part because our perceptual habits were formed in an older kind of space I have called high modernism. The new architecture, therefore, like other cultural products I have evoked in the preceding marks, stands as something like an imperative to grow new organs, to expand our sensorium. And later in the essay, he talks about this fact that it'll take the next generation who grew up in this postmodern hyperspace to have the neural capacities and the perceptual habits to be able to even understand and see it. And here's the building. It looks like nothing to us now. But at one point, it was like, holy mackerel, what is that? And here's the inside. The neurobiological sublime and the materialist alienation. It's kind of a materialist alienation. The brain's materiality can, has not kept up with the mutation of the materiality of the outside world. Since 1991, when he wrote these prophetic words, the landscape of understanding of neuroplastic potential of the brain and its entangled relation to an architecturally induced, accelerated cultural plasticity has changed considerably. Architecture here is understood in its expanded capacity as building, social space, infrastructure, dynamic networks, as well as a driving epigenetic force of subjectivity projection, production. In regard to this requirement to grow new, organs, grow new organs of perception in the context of a cultural context beyond the capacities of a brain whose habits of perception were formed, for instance, in high modernism, I have used the term neurobiological sublime. Okay, I don't, this would be a whole other section on cognitive capitalism, but I think that the, the, the ideas that I've spoken about and the idea that we're moving into the society of data and how this society of data would have repercussions on the neuroplasticity. I want to read you one, one uh, sorry, I want to read one more quote. 
but we, you know. Okay, here. So here is epigenetic architecture and cognitive, the internet of everything, and that means your brain too. So here's a baby on the internet, and this is a fabulous uh, quote from 2001. Ima uh, Andy Clark. Imagine that you begin using the, the, remember all the stuff about neuroplasticity, the primary repertoire, the secondary repertoire, learning languages. Remember all the stuff that we talked about. Imagine that you begin using the web at age four. Dedicated software agents track and adapt to your emerging interests and random explorations. They then help direct your attention to new ideas, web pages, and products. Over the next 70 years, you and your software agents are locked in a complex dance of co-evolutionary change and learning, each influencing and being influenced by the other. In such a case, in a very real sense, the software entities look less like part of your problem solving environment than part of you. The intelligence system now confronts the wider world is biological you plus the software agents. These external bundles of code are contributing rather like subpersonal cognitive functions active in your brain. Okay, I'd like to stop there. So, so. So um, I'd like to thank you very much, Warren, um, for this very interesting lecture. Um, and thank you for sharing your research on the brain uh, with us, on the poetic brain, on the complexity. Um, I definitely had the opportunity to learn more about neuroscience today than I have in most of the other days of my life. So thanks for that. Um, since we've gone a bit long, I would propose that we have some beers. And maybe if you have questions for Warren, you can ask them directly to him uh, with the beers that we have of the lecture. And I'd like you guys to just once again thank Warren for the lecture.